Here's them, um, we're just stamping some of the coins from John's reign. So we're talking about the years between 1207 and 1211. Um, basically, the coin starts life as a small blank disc, and there's a TV link made of future or silver. And then we place it on what's called the pile of the future disc, the lower uh, die, and the handle, what I call it, the impression of the king's head on it. And then, just like the safety, drop this group down, and then we drop what's called the trussle. The trussle is the other half of the die, which has um, the symbol of the, the sun, the moon, and stars, which basically King John's name, I rule everything on this planet. Yes, drop that down nice and gentle, so that die. And then we just one bash with a hammer, two bashes with a hammer, and um, doubles to the point, which is unattractive, and it's moreover unusable. So, that's it there. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely brilliant. Yep. Both sides. Look, you're a time machine. Go back to um, Ireland, you know, around 1210. You can buy your round of beers with this uh, silver pen. Well, in some of the bars I go. That's the idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are um, the spurs that were used by um, cavalrymen in medieval times. Um, from about 1050, we see a bit of a curvature going on. Whereas before, they would have been perfectly straight. Mm -hmm. So in Irish history, when we're talking about the Normans coming to Ireland, which is 1170, this style was well in use at that stage. And the idea was, was that the cavalryman would point his feet out from the horse, therefore, cruelly, you yes. know, ejecting our little quick spurs, as they were known, yes, into the flanks of the horse, which would encourage him yeah. against them, a wall of spurs. Now, the style of these changed over, over time, and um, eventually, the simpler um, spur of earlier times evolved into what's called a rowel spur, which people might be familiar with from Clint Eastwood films and the like. <laughs> so you have um, the spin there, so it's a bit more effective. And th th these were used right up to course, as I say, to, you know, relatively recent times, you know. So that's one thing to look at. Yes, indeed. Um, we have a range of daggers here, for instance. What we're trying oh, to do. Are these Irish uh, well, well, type dagger? We'll just get Dave to bring scheme. over the skein here as yeah. well, if you don't mind, Dave. Yeah. Um, but um, what we try and do is, we, when we're dealing with an audience here um, at an event in Ireland, we try and show differences in ethnicity and differences in time. A few different daggers, just to show you, um, give you a baseline of daggers from Europe at the time, and then we'll show you the Irish scheme. What you have here is a base guard, Switzerland, circa 1400. Here we have what's known as a bollock, quite rudely, or um, if it's um, before the, the watershed, we would say a kidney dagger. Right. Um, British, and I mean British as in Scottish or English, but popularised all over uh, Europe. So that's a dagger that's used around 1500. Um, and, and would these be used in battle? Um, yeah, these are battle type daggers used as sidearms, you know. Of course, they're, yeah. they're not the main yeah. weapon, but yeah. um, it'd also be used for cutting bread, cutting meat. This one here now is more of a specialised weapon. It's um, what we call a left hand dagger, which is a bit discriminatory towards um, left handed people, but basically it was used in the left hand while you're using the sword in the right hand. This is Italian, about 1550. These long quillums um, serve the purpose of blocking blows, and also because they're long, they absorb more shock, which means there's less chance of dropping the dagger in a, a combat situation. Yes, yes. So that's a dagger that was really used um, for dueling rather than for battle, but they would have been carried it by pikemen across their back yeah, as yeah, a sidearm. Yeah. Again, it's just a sidearm, it's, yes, it's not um, okay. the main weapon. The Irish skein, um, however, though, is probably the longest stylus of um, knife been used um, in Europe at this time. Now, it's not because the Irish you know, are more long than other men and all that great hard crack. Um, what it really is, is that a lot of Irish men wouldn't have afforded swords, they'd be part-timers. Sure. So the skein served as a, as a sword, as well as a dagger for, for a lot of Irish men. It was cheaply produced in so far as it didn't have the hill furniture of a cross guard. It didn't need a pommel now, but it was quite manageable. Um, it was also um, served by a heavy back, which gives it more strength. It, yeah, yeah. it also has a very cute point. Mm. The cute point could have been used to pierce male armour, you know? That, that's one that's idea, at least. Yeah. Quite well represented in the Irish archaeological record. There's a fair few of them around. The most famous one is from County Limerick, in a site called Corbin. So. Yeah. And, and uh, just before we move on from now, do yeah. you actually collect all of these yourself? Yeah, I collect um, these weapons. Some of these weapons are commissions based on Irish finds, and uh, I do the leather work and the woodwork myself. Yeah, so, yeah. Very, the, very, um, very intricate uh, leather work on this. Yeah, this sheath is based on um, 
a sheet from County Offaly from Kilcommon, and um, it symbolises the late medieval period that we call in Ireland the Gaelic Resurgence. So it's basically when the high water tide of the Anglo-Norman conquest has now been pushed back, and the Gaelic culture uh, begins to flower for one last time. Sure. Before you know, five years in the laws, yeah, all, that, all, sale, all that stuff. Yeah. And, and do you find there is a revised interest in all of this, the medieval weaponry, uh, as a result of kind of programs like the Vikings, Game of Thrones, and all of that sort of stuff? Um, yeah, I think it is. Um, slowly but surely, we're, 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 I, I'm seeing more interest um, in, in events of this sort. Anyway, um, schools are also becoming interested, not not just in the medieval period, but obviously in things like 1916, World War One, 1798, all, all that stuff. Um, people Reading some history. I think Game of Thrones, um, stuff that does, does definitely help, even though it's a fantasy. A lot of the politics in Game of Thrones was inspired by you know historical campaigns like the Wars of the Roses, so it kind of makes sense and it's great. That, yeah, and um, some of the equipment being used is yeah. very similar. And of course, for an Irish audience, programs like Game of Thrones and Vikings being made in Ireland, uh, a lot of people working as extras yeah. in, in these programs, so it's a bigger <laughs> interest yeah. anyway than you might even expect in the first place. Just finally, Dave, before we finish off here, yeah. just have a look at these uh, arrows. Yeah. It looks very interesting. Yep. A range of arrows here. Um, the most typical type of arrow found in Irish archaeology, about 70% of arrows, and you know we're talking about the 10th century up to the 15th century, would have what we call a bodkin arrowhead, which is a narrow arrowhead designed to pierce male armour, male armour being the most common type of armour used in Ireland. This type of um, arrowhead wouldn't pierce plate armour. Generally speaking, arrowheads are made of what we would now call low carbon steel, whereas plate armour is generally speaking made of medium carbon steel. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to pierce that, but of course there's always the gaps. And there's always the horses bearing the rider. Um, another type of arrow, less common in Ireland, but still recorded in Irish archaeology, is what you call a swallowtail or a broadhead arrow, which is designed primarily for hunting, but you can imagine the type of wound that yeah, would deliver. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the barbs, yeah. fairly cruel. Yeah. Um, an interesting one here is an arrow that's in the shape of a cage, really. A few bars there, sometimes there's four bars, sometimes three. And these were designed to carry combustible material to set fire ah, to your opponent's right. roof. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So we've seen, fire. We've seen, seen these. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. But they don't usually survive for obvious reasons in archaeology as much as you might like. <laughs> and there you go. You can understand why. You yeah. understand why. That's a very, very collection. I see you've got That's kind of visors, helmets, chain mail, etc. Yeah. There. So it's a, it's a really, really, really good exhibition. And you go around various... Uh, yeah, we do various festivals like this, around so. Ireland. We do specialist film work. Um, I work with the Heritage Council as well, doing school visits in Ireland as well. So we're we kept quite busy in the academic year with the schools, and generally speaking, the summer we have events most weekends. Heritage Week, of course, that was by far the busiest time. Incredible. <laughs> yeah. So, Dave, thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you. I'm sure everybody's interested here, and all of us today. Thank Thanks. You very much. Great to meet you. Great to meet you.